Thank you, Massimo. I can only have a physiological approach following two giants and having more giants following me on physiology uh, today. Uh, first of all, my disclosure of uh, conflict of interest. Um, I have collaborated and researched uh, with a series of hemodynamic monitoring companies. Uh, my biggest conflict probably is actually that I do believe that having extra information on blood flow for complex patients is really crucial uh, to get the right uh, uh, information in our mind and to change uh, potentially our therapeutic strategies. I'm often asked, uh, is more important blood pressure, is it more important uh, perfusion? But they're both clearly equally important. We heard from the previous speakers though that through evolution, the human body has uh, made the protection of blood pressure a, uh, an emergency at all levels. So blood pressure is normally very well regulated. So that's an important concept, why? It means that a de novo hypotension should always be treated as a magic medical emergency. So if we got a patient that we see in the emergency department and we think that the patient is in shock, a hypotensive patient in the problem, he's got a problem. But I think it's really important to put the two things together. It's hypotension, so vasoplegia, uh, vascular hyporesponsive, whatever we want to call that. And at the same time, coupling that with hypoperfusion that is allowing us to identify the sickest group of patients. I really like this study by the group of Shapiro, which I think is not quoted enough, in which they clearly uh, show the interaction between the presence of hypotension and the presence of hypoperfusion as measured by uh, high levels of lactate. So for instance, I could see patients with uh, a good blood pressure, or what we would consider a good blood pressure, and if these patients still are not hypotensive but have a high lactate, these patients are already associated with a quite a significant increase in mortality. At the same time, patients that maybe have cleared their lactate or are about to clear their lactate, but if they are still vasoplegic for some reasons, we've not reversed shot completely, for some reason they still require some uh, vasopressors going here. Those hypotensive patients, despite not having a very high lactate, again, they are associated with a very high mortality already. And it is the interaction between the two. When we have patients that are on profound vasoplegia and profound hyperlactatemia, profound hyperperfusion, those are very sick patients. I do want to get extra information here. These are those patients where I definitely want to get more information about the flow. I do want to understand, really, with a crucial timing, not lose too much time, no time for being very clever and maybe trying just liters and liters of fluids without seeing what's happening here. I really need to get the things right here. Now, these are markers and these are physiological variables that we can measure. But first of all, let's remember, first of all, the clinical uh, spectrum that we have in our patient is what is allowing us the identification of shock. So I will use uh, the examination, see if the mental state of the patient is right, if the temperature of the skin is different, if there is mottling in the skin, if there is a difference between extremities in the temperature of the patient. The urine output is dropped. All these things they have to prompt me to look a bit more careful. And then I can start to take some extra measurements and identify the group of patients that maybe require more attention. We heard from Professor Magda how fluids work really and why fluids can be successful in helping us to increase venous return and cardiac output. And in practice, when we uh, have uh, our vascular compartment that we can imagine as elastic band, well, part of the blood that is in the circulation is in the stress volume. And as we said, the other part is what we call the stress volume. Now, the stress volume generates the mean systemic feeling pressure. It's very important uh, to summarize what was said also before, to realize that the mean systemic feeling pressure, it's our aim when we want to increase uh, cardiac output. What we are trying to do really is to increase the stress volume so that there is an increase in mean systemic feeling pressure. And we do hope that by increasing the mean systemic feeling pressure, something else happens. The gradient for the venous return increases. Because indeed, another very important pressure in all of this is my CVP, or my right atrial pressure. Now, if I want to have a flow, I need to have a gradient. That's true for any hydraulic system, not just in the human body. I need to have a difference between two pressures and flow will flow from the higher pressure to the lower pressure. So the, a good heart normally works to try to maintain the CVP as low as possible. Indeed, hopefully, the average CVP in this room is probably around zero, unless some of us, I hope not, are on heart failure. Um, and so this is a very important concept. When I give fluids, I want to raise the pressure here. If the pressure rises too much here, yes, I may have increased the mean systemic feeling pressure, but if the heart is not able to cope, 
and the CVP rises, the gradient may have not changed. I will not see any increase in cardiac output. I will not see an increase in venous return, first of all. We looked at this, and did we measure the gradient of the venous return in patients that were responding to a fluid challenge, either with an increase in cardiac output or not. And indeed, what was found was exactly this mechanism. Patients that increase their cardiac output, therefore, uh, by definition, they've increased their venous return, are patients in which there is an increase in the gradient between the mean systemic filling pressure and the CVP. While patients that do not increase their cardiac output, that can happen for two reasons with fluids. Either we've not given enough fluids to stretch the system, but we were able to find that the PMS was going up here, so that was not the case. What happened is that the CVP and the PMS basically they increase at similar level, and therefore the gradient does not increase. I will not see any increase in cardiac output, but I will start to pay the price for an unnecessary amount of fluids. A CVP that rises without an increase in cardiac output, it's a price I'm starting to pay for an unnecessary amount of fluid that I'm giving. So, um, if we have a septic patient, what happens? I apologize for the simplicity of this cartoon, but in practice, we are increasing our capacitance because as we heard before, our vessel, they start to become a bit more relaxed. I've not lost volume, but the volume is distributed in this moment in a different way. So our approach when we give fluids to patients with sepsis is basically to try to refill this new compartment here and to try to increase the mean systemic filling pressure. But if you follow me on this physiological concept, then I can actually see another opportunity that we have to increase the mean systemic filling pressure. Well, we have our vasodilation. Now, yes, I can work with fluids, but at the same time, I can try to restore the capacitor maybe to a lower level. So therefore, I can squeeze a bit my vessel, hopefully recruiting stress volume. And this, in a simple way, it's what happens when we give fluids to the mean systemic filling pressure. Now, for the pressors, I will come back to this in a second. The interaction is a little bit more complex. But why do I think it's very important to focus on vasopressors early? Because I think over the last few years, we moved from an era where we were not giving any fluids at all to our patient to an era where we seen that every time there is a problem with hypoperfusion or hypertension, we just give extra fluids. And sometimes I think we may delay the starting of a vasopressor. And if you look, for instance, at uh, patients with uh, septic shock and the time in between the uh, initial occurrence of shock and starting of a vasopressor, there is a correlation between patients that receive vasopressors a bit late and an increase in organ failure and therefore also mortality for these patients. And also, if we looked at uh, uh, targets, as we said, our target is not starting a vasopressor. Our target is achieving a perfusion pressure there. Well, patients that are maintained for a low level of perfusion pressure to, uh, for a long period of time, well, these patients are associated, again, with quite a significant increase in mortality. I do find this study very interesting. This study is being published by the group of Anna Wunsch uh, on JAMA in 2017. And this is something that they uh, published out of an opportunity that happened due to a shortage of uh, norepinephrine in, uh, in America. And they found that there were some hospitals that were affected by the shortage of uh, norepinephrine more than others. And by looking at the all confounding factors uh, and et cetera, what they found that was that if you were admitted to one of these hospitals during the shortage of norepinephrine, the norepinephrine usage actually went down, but there was also an increase in the mortality for this patient. Now, of course, this is not a randomized controlled trial. This is just an association, and there are different explanations about this. It could be that simply they use less vasopressors. It could be that they use different type of vasopressors, and indeed, for instance, phenylephrine would use more in this period. It could simply be that being in an hospital that is not able to cope with a shortage of norepinephrine is just unmasking some quality uh, indicators uh, about this hospital. But nevertheless, this is interesting that, again, maybe uh, in patients with septic shock, delaying a uh, vasopressor could actually be something that could impact uh, the mortality for these patients. Now, I remember uh, when I started medicine, uh, there was a very clear cut between inotropes and vasoconstrictors. And a vasopressor does not increase your cardiac output because, of course, it increases your afterload. Now, that I think it's a classic paradigm that was taught in books, but I don't think it really reflects physiology if we really see what happened uh, at the bedside. And indeed, very often, especially in the early phases of 
uh, septic shock, a vasopressors can be quite uh, a fast uh, opportunity that we have actually to increase cardiac output. It should not be the only one, but there are patients that increase cardiac output if I give a vasopressor. Now, the physiology needs to be the same, so how do we explain this? Well, an explanation could be that uh, we are uh, recruiting stress volume. If this was the similar effect or the same effect that I would achieve just by giving fluids, I would have just shifted the venous return curve to the right. However, we heard before that when we give a vasopressor, that's not the only thing that happens. When we give a vasopressor, we're also changing the resistance of the system. So this would be the stress volume effect, but if we're adding the change in the resistance of the system, the truth is, is that we are increasing cardiac output with vasopressor in these cases, but the increase that we see is not as big as if we were just uh, uh, increasing the, just by giving volume and having the same degree of increase in mean systemic filling pressure. This was actually uh, demonstrated in this uh, nice article uh, by the group uh, of MAS, in which indeed they do take some measurements and they looked at what happened to uh, cardiac output and uh, venous return curves when the, the uh, vasopressor was added to the circulation, and indeed they found exactly the same. If the effect was the one of just giving fluids, one would have expected this increase in cardiac output, but there was an increase in the resistance, and therefore the increase in cardiac output was a bit lower. What happens then if I have a patient that decreases cardiac output? Because we do observe also patients in which we start the vasopressor and actually the cardiac output goes down. Well, then, again, we are recruiting stress volume. So if the effect was just the one similar to give fluids, we still should have seen a shift in the venous return curve to the right. And therefore, we should have seen an increase in cardiac output. However, we just said that we have seen a decrease in cardiac output. So what happens here? Well, there are two things that are happening. One, either the resistance in the system has changed a lot. So I am actually increasing so much the resistance that what I'm achieving in terms of an increase in mean systemic filling pressure will drop significantly lower my venous return curve. However, this would not be physiological because I don't see uh, this happening with a vasopressor that my cardiac output goes down, but also, for instance, my cardiac performance improved because the greater blood pressure has also gone down. What really happened is that also we are also shifting the cardiac function curve to the right, and therefore the overall effect is this. So we are seeing, yes, an increase in the resistance, but also these are patients that, yes, are affected by the increase in afterload, and therefore are patients in which the vasopressor may decrease cardiac output. Now, this was also demonstrated, again, by the same group in which they observed exactly the same. If I had to give a, a, a vasopressor and the effect was just that of giving fluids, I would see this increase in cardiac output. Uh, if the resistance effect was only this one, this would have been the case, but what they measure was exactly this, which is exactly what physiology is telling us. Now, from this, it's very important though, that we realize that just looking at blood pressure is not telling us anything about this. And therefore, in this complex group of patients, if I want to understand what happens to the cardiac output, I can only measure it. Because if I start from a situation in which I've decided clinically that I want to increase the cardiac output to improve the perfusion, Really, the direction that the patient can go is really everywhere. And if I don't uh, look at these points, and if I don't look at these points by looking, for instance, at flow and changes in CVP and the trends in cardiac output and CVP, it becomes very difficult for me to understand if my therapy is going in the right direction or not. And uh, the other important thing about in considering a vasopressor early or at least identify patients that could benefit from a vasopressor is also the fact that there is a clear association between the amount of fluid that we give and the outcome in our patients. Again, these are large observational cohorts, so uh, making uh, a, a step from uh, association and causality is not the right thing, but the data is pretty consistent. This is just the last of a series of papers, the largest uh, published so far by uh, the group of Marek, in which there's a clear exponential increase in mortality when patients are given more than five uh, liters in the first 24 hours. Now, what do we use to guide our fluid management? Uh, we may repeat Fenice, in, I suspect, in a few years, but uh, the recent data show that still, in 2015, the variable that is used the most to guide fluid management is the CVP. 
And uh, I hope that from the lectures from before of uh, Prof. Magda and also what I tried to say uh, now about how the Venus return works, that we do understand that actually physiologically targeting a high CVP does not make any sense. A CVP that rises as a result of fluid administration is a sort of a side effect of the augmentation of volume that we're putting in the circulation, but should never be our goal. And uh, this is a very interesting sub-study by the group of uh, James Russell in Vancouver. Uh, they looked at, at patients that were enrolled in a previous study on vasopressin, and they separated patients between values obtained in uh, CVP at 12 hours. Now, this is very interesting. If you looked at the CVP of more than 12 at 12 hours, these are actually patients that have a much higher mortality compared to the other groups. And I think this is physiology. And interestingly, if then they looked at what was the, roughly the amount of volume that was given uh, to patients that had a, an advantage in terms of survival, it was about three liters. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that we should be giving three liters to everyone. This is just average data with a significant and large standard deviation. So some patients were receiving less and some more. However, clearly it's far less than giving five, six, or, or seven liters of fluids. And suggest that probably at some point we need to understand when to stop if our patients are not responding just to fluid therapy. And this, I think, is even more important when we looked at the pharmacodynamics of fluid administration. This is a study we published last year in critical care medicine. And what we really wanted to do was actually go back to basics and start to treat fluids as if they were any other drug. So we gave a fluid challenge and we measured the pharmacodynamic effect of fluids on the circulation by using an approach very similar to the one that you would use with any other drug. So we looked at the areas under the curve, we look at the maximum effect, and we look when the maximum effect occurred, and we also look what happened after 10 minutes after the uh, administration of fluid was finished. So what happened? Well, the area under the curve, of course, was higher for responders versus non-responders. This is just a, it's a self-selected group of patients. Uh, this is interesting in terms of understanding the response to cardiac output. The maximum change in cardiac output occurred just one minute after the end of fluid administration, which means it takes very little for the last drop of fluids that we are giving to go in the system and to create that effect. And more importantly, after 10 minutes, we found that both in responders and non-responders, the effect was basically dissipated, which means that if I miss the increase after one minute and I just go back after 20 minutes, I may have missed completely what happened in this patient. Now, this study to us is opening a lot of questions, and I, uh, there are different explanations of why this could have happened. First of all, the settings in which we did this study was not the early resuscitation of a patient. It was patients that were already stabilized, and we just wanted to look at the kinetics. So it is possible that if the cardiac output was already regulated, those patients may have just had an increase in cardiac output because we stressed the Frank Starling curve, but if they did not need that cardiac output, they just dissipated the volume. It could be that it was some capillary leak. However, I, I would disagree probably with that for a short uh, bolus of fluid and especially in post-surgical patient. Um, but it's posing us some questions in the sense that what is a fluid response to their patient? If a patient increases the cardiac output, but then the cardiac output goes back to uh, the baseline after 20 minutes, have we really achieved something? Do we carry on with the strategy? How much are we happy to pay in terms of the amount of fluid that we're giving to carry on with that? And uh, it's also important because it seems like that if you look at our bedside practice, not always we take the information about our therapeutic challenges to inform us about the next thing that we are doing. In Fenice, about 50% of patients received an extra bolus of fluid. And we went back and asked the clinicians to say, to tell us basically, uh, was this a patient that responded to fluid initially or not? What we found is about 48% of patients with a, an initial positive response receive some extra fluids. And when I looked at this, I said, well, this is great, because actually I don't want everyone that responded before to fluids to receive some extra fluids. If the lactate is normalized, the blood pressure is fine, and the patient is better, I've achieved what I want. I don't need always to stay on the plateau part of the Frank Sterling curve. But maybe that was not the explanation, because when we looked at the uncertain response, still 52% of clinicians they just gave an extra bolus of fluid, but it's true, it's real life practice, I also do it. I want to give fluids, I don't know what happened, I'm not so sure, but the patient is very sick, 
either you go back and come back in two hours or you do something, so maybe you do that. But this I don't understand. 49% of patients in which there was a negative response to fluids, and we didn't question that. We just asked the clinicians if they were thinking if the response was negative or not. Then they received some extra fluids. It seems like, as DDA was saying, it's almost a reflex. If something happens to the blood pressure, if something happens to the perfusion or the urine ample, we just give another bolus of fluid. So uh, I think we need to be a little bit more careful. I'm not saying restrictive, but a bit more careful when we give fluids. It does not mean that we should just give vasopressor without uh, thinking about what happened, because also being on high doses of vasopressors has got significant implications for the circulation. And in this paper from the group of Dunser and Takala, uh, there's a clear association between being on very high doses of uh, norepinephrine and uh, having a high mortality, but this is something that we really need to think about. So with our group, we started to uh, look at ways maybe to predict the response or to understand how we can guide the response to norepinephrine when we uh, want to uh, start the vasopressor maybe in states of shock. Uh, we recently published this paper with Ignacio Monge and Professor Pinsky, in which we, it is an editorial about a paper, but, you know, in which we explain some of these concepts. Um, the bottom line, and I will try to keep this simple, is that if we look at the ratio between the pulse pressure variation and the stroke volume variation, this can inform us about a physiological variable called dynamic arterial elastance, which we think can give us some information around how patients may respond or do respond to vasopressors. We did a series of uh, validation studies on this. The first study was done by uh, the group of Ignacio, just on fluid loading. And they were able to demonstrate that this variable was predicting which patients were increasing blood pressure if they were increasing cardiac output uh, with a fluid bolus administration. We also validate this concept in spontaneous breathing patients. Why is that important? Because as we know, SVV and PPV, as indices of fluid responsiveness, do not work in spontaneous breathing patients. But we were able to demonstrate that the same factors that affect one variable and the other are basically minimized and take away, taken away by the fact that we're using the ratio between the two. And then there have been a series of papers in which, for instance, we found exactly what DDA was funding before in terms of fluids. If I give fluids to uh, my patient, even in patients in which uh, there is an increase in cardiac output, often I will see a change on the arterial load of this patient, and indeed this was demonstrated with a decrease in the dynamic arterial elastance when I was giving fluids to these patients, which suggests that there are a group of patients, for instance, in which if I give a bolus of fluid, the cardiac output may increase, but the blood pressure will not change at all. This is like vasodilating the system. But if I'm just looking at blood pressure, I would be completely blind to any of these changes. A French group started to look at this variable to see whether it could be used to actually predict maybe patients when they can be weaned off uh, norepinephrine. So we know that a shock is uh, uh, reversing, the patient is getting better, but we are still on 0 0.1, 0 0.05, mics of Nora, and the assumption was can we actually predict which patient will not drop the blood pressure when we stop the norepinephrine. And they found very interesting results that this variable was able to uh, predict when it was quite high to actually to uh, uh, those patients that would have not uh, dropped the blood pressure if you uh, were uh, stopping the vasopressor infusion. So we thought uh, this is very promising, so why don't we do a study in which we try to put the two things together. This is an animal study that we just published on the British Journal uh, of Anesthesia, and we wanted to uh, uh, explore a bit more this variable, especially in the context of doing something both with fluids and with uh, vasoactive drugs. So we did this with uh, rabbits, and uh, what we uh, found was that we separated the groups into a group that received um, a vasopressor with phenylephrine, and a group that received uh, sodium nitroposide, so a vasodilator. We then achieved the status of stability. We then gave a fluid challenge. We measured everything again. Then we stopped the medication. We went back to baseline. And then we did some control bleeding to the patient. We see what happened to the dynamic arterial elastance. Now, the interesting thing that was a bit surprising for us is that if you see the effect on the phenylephrine group, it was actually the dynamic arterial elastance was decreasing with an increased dose of phenylephrine. And the nitroprusside was actually going up with increases doses of a vasodilator, which is a little bit in contrast to what we were expecting from a previous study. So 
What is the explanation of this? The explanation is probably that when we want to look at this variable, we need to look not just at the number, which is the ratio between two variables, but also the kinetic and the dynamics of the other two variables. Indeed, if we separate for pulse pressure variation and stroke volume variation, what we're seeing is that, for instance, when the dynamic arterial elastome goes down, of course it goes down for both uh, uh, SVV and PPV, and that's what you would expect from physiology. But in our experiment, it went much lower, the decrease in pulse pressure variation compared to the decrease in stroke volume variation, and that explains why the dynamic arterial elastomes in this study decrease. So it means that, unfortunately, I think we need to do more study to understand how to use it and to interpret it in bedside practice. <laughs> Um, we try to put some of this concept if you're interested in reading something on out arterial load and how this work. But in practice, I think we are seeing that it's not just a marker of arterial load. It's a marker of arteroventricular coupling is depending really on many uh, variables, not just what happened to the arterial side of the circulation, but to the contractility itself of the heart. Uh, I'm concluding uh, just by saying let's be careful when we give fluids. I'm not saying go home and don't give fluids. Of course, it's very important. Uh, for what we do uh, with our patient. But there is a very fine balance between overload and hypovolemia, and let's consider if uh, using a vasopressor is something that can help us uh, to get this right. So uh, I think really for anything that we do in physiology, and fluids are pressor are so important in the things that we do at the bedside, we always need to remember physiology. Frank Stanley mechanism is not the only thing that works. They are not in contradictions, these models of explaining the physiology. They're all saying the same thing just looking at the same thing from different perspectives. Let's look at the venous return. Let's start to think maybe a bit more around arteroventricular coupling. What do I do in my practice? I look at blood pressure, cardiac output, and CVP, and that gives me a better understanding of what happens when I give a fluid challenge, if I want to give a vasopressor, and also the interaction between the two. Thank you. Mm -hmm.